Hello friends and welcome to another worship service with Felton Biola United Methodist Church. We are an inclusive, reconciling community of believers who are determined to reach out beyond the walls of our church with the love of Christ. Mission work is who we are, and we'd like to invite you to become a part of our hands-on ministries. We have three main goals for missions, as well as a number of smaller goals throughout the year. Our main ministries are, are our clothing ministry, where people can come and get clothing free of charge. We serve people who are struggling with homelessness, with job loss, house fires, whatever it is that causes them to have a need for clothing, we are there for them. Our feeding ministry is also very active, distributing food to more than 100 seniors plus various families in our area every month. We are always looking for volunteers to assist people throughout through these missions and we would welcome you to contact us so that we can connect you with the coordinators and you can become involved. The contact information is on a slide at the end of this video. Next, we'd like to welcome Gary Folk with an update on our efforts to build a new facility on our Canterbury land. Hi, I'm Gary Folk. I'm the new building chair for the Felton Viola United Methodist Church. Many of you know that we've been working diligently the, for the last number of years to build a new church home on our facility, our new, our six acres of land that we have on Canterbury Road. A lot, we've been kind of on hold since the pandemic, but since we're coming out of the pandemic and we have pledges and money that has been coming in, we think that this is the perfect time for us to, to start again, to really see if we can bring this uh, goal of ours of a new church building to fruition. In that regards, we've contacted church development services who we've been working with in the past. Um, we've updated them on what we thought our current needs were for a new facility. Um, they're gonna be working with us to get back to us on pricing and uh, what they see uh, we can do with a new church building. Um, with our new church building, uh, we hope to have increased parking, handicapped accessibility, and we're looking to have the room that we can do our meet our programs and goals and with missions and and other programs that we would be able to meet with the uh, expanding community um, if you've pledged please try to get your pledges in the money into us as soon as possible if you haven't pledged please consider pledging we're going to need that, that money to go along with the money we already have to start this process and and, and put into to, to action um, hopefully sooner than later, the um, actual construction of the new building. Um, you can't go anywhere around our, our, where our new land is and you see all the new homes and developments that are, that are growing. Um, and we want to be in a position where we can serve the new community. Um, so keep praying that we follow God's mission for us um, with this endeavor. If you, um, if you want, have any questions or concerns, please contact uh, Pastor Sally or myself. If you want to become a member of the New Church Building Committee or have any ideas um, for how to bring this uh, quicker to fruition, um, please feel free to contact myself or Pastor Sally. Um, with God's grace, we'll be able to one day soon have a new church building. I look forward to keep bringing you updates as we get more and more information. Um, as soon as we know more information, you'll be hearing from me soon. So take care and God bless. Thank you, Gary. We look forward to your next update. Just a reminder, your tithes, gifts, and offerings are important to the ministries of this church. We cannot continue to reach out to the community and the world without your generous gifts. So please know that at the end of this service, you will find a slide with information on how to send a check or donate using our e-giving app. Now, let's begin our worship as we sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Eyes 
As people of faith, we accept our interconnectedness with all people and all creation. And so we unite our hearts in prayer for those in need. Let us draw near to the divine and to one another through our prayers of intercession. There's a responsive line at the end of each section. I will say, Eternal One, and please respond with, We lift our prayers in faith. Will you pray with me? Source of all life, creator of the earth and all that is in it, we lift our prayers of thanks to you for the beauty of the earth that surrounds us, for summer breezes after the rain. Thanks be to you, creator of the heavens and earth, to whom all beings belong. Eternal One, we lift our prayers in faith. Source of all being, our lifespan is short at any moment to be taken from us. Free us from greed and fill us with generosity. Strip us of our own fear and strengthen us to love one another as you have loved us. Eternal One, we lift our prayers in faith. For those who struggle to find adequate food and clean water, clothing and shelter, and other basic needs of life, we pray that governments and agencies, including the Church, will reach out to change the course of their history for good, sharing from the abundance held by others. Grant us the courage and generosity 
to be part of the solution, working with local charities and organizations and reaching out around the globe. Eternal One, we lift our prayers in faith. We pray for places torn apart by violence and for those who look to violence as a solution. We pray for countries who feel threatened by their more powerful neighbors. Amplify the calm voices calling for peace and reconciliation that they might be heard, that hardened hearts might be softened, that ancient divisions might be mended. We pray for those who sacrifice so much for the good of many, who risk their even their lives for the cause of peace. Open our hearts and our pocketbooks to be active peacemakers too. Eternal One, we lift our prayers in faith. We pray for travelers. We pray for refugees looking for safety and welcome, and for students who have left the familiar to study in distant places. Eternal One, we lift our prayers in faith. Giver of hope, we lift our prayers in faith, looking always toward peace and goodness. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to ask each of you to think about the people that you see and that you interact with on a regular basis. Maybe people in your family, people you know or new from work, from any social or community clubs or organizations you belong to, or maybe people from our church. Think about how long you've known them and what kind of history you have with them and how important they are to you. Some of you might be thinking of long-term relationships and some may be folks you've only known a short while, but you've become close to them pretty quickly. Now think about why you were initially drawn to them. Was it something about their humor or their personality? Did you have a hobby or a social interest in common? Are you related and so you didn't choose them, but their family just the same? Most of us can identify something that we have in common with the people that we associate with. This year, I've noticed that My friends are somewhat homogenous. Most of the people I hang out with are white, somewhere around middle class and at least somewhat religious. Oh, I have a few friends who are people of color or a different religion, but honestly, not statistically significant. I'm pretty sure that's not a good thing in God's eyes. And if I'm honest, There are folks I'd just as soon not have to deal with. People who look at life so differently than I do. I'm really not sure how to interact. Or people who say and do things that, frankly, tick me off. I'll bet that most of us feel the same way from time to time. Today I want to talk about our relationships and how important they are in our development as Christ followers. We can look around at our families and our neighborhoods, and most of us feel the warm, safe feelings of comfort. Some of the people here in this church were once strangers, and they're now people who hold a special place in our hearts. Many of them have prayed with us, struggled with us, rejoiced with us, We've worked on mission projects together and fought with each other when it came to deciding the color of the front door of the church. But at the end of the day, we love each other 
and we know that we are connected. People who were once strangers are now family and friends because of our shared experience. In the book of Ephesians, Paul uses a number of terms to speak of the life-giving effect of the life and death of Jesus. Words we're familiar with, such as atonement, redemption, and today the concept of reconciliation. When we talk about reconciling something, I, th I think about reconciling a checkbook or an account log, meaning that the books are balanced. Things add up to what they're meant to. We say that the parties in a corporate dispute have been sent to arbitration in order to be reconciled. In other words, they're being ass assisted to in order to reach a compromise so that all parties can live with it. In families, we talk of re reconciliation as the process of, of compromise and forgiveness so that there can be some harmony between the members. All of these understandings shed some light on what Paul is pointing towards, but he's saying something a lot more powerful than if we all compromise a bit and the world would be a happier, more peaceful place, even if that's true. When we look around our world, we can see endless places in which reconciliation is needed between nations, between political parties, between religions, within religious denominations like the current struggle within the UMC over the topic of human sexuality, and in our families and social groups where conflict and competition holds us apart. We can see lots of places where we would want God's love and peace to drop down like a blanket over the situation. And very occasionally that does seem to happen. But if we're honest, most of us want a peace that flows out of someone else's recognition of their wrongness or error and for them to come around to our way of thinking and seeing things. And even when we acknowledge that we need to move a bit, we find it difficult to let go of the issue or perspective and that contributed to the hostility in the first place. Remember that I said that I struggle with this? Ask your staff parish relations committee because we've talked about how I've been working on this very same topic over the last few years. Paul says in our passage, while we were once strangers, we are now brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. The significance of this statement to the people who first heard it is hard for us to understand. Of course, Jesus is peace. This letter is directed though to both Jews and Gentiles two groups that would have been in different societies and different cultures. They would have existed in the same area, but they would have had limited contact with each other. And the contact that they did have was marked with challenges. But here's the writer of Ephesians saying to them now that Christ has done the work on the cross, the walls are broken down, and that they are to be united and unified into one family. I think it's hard for us to get up, get how remarkable that is. The words, he is our peace, Jesus is our peace, are words that threaten revolution. It's hard for us to grasp how those could be the words of treason. These are words that are opposed to the state. Saying Jesus is our peace, well, those are words that get folks riled up in the first century. They're words meant for the same kinds of demonstrations and protests we see when people say things like Black Lives Matter or the election was stolen. They're words that would have caused lots of strong feelings, outrage, indignation, and even anger. If we're going to understand this passage, we have to understand that saying that Jesus was to be honored would have been an insult to the empire, to the Caesar who 
was seen as godlike in that region during the first century. And here's Paul saying that these very different factions, the Jews and the Gentiles, are to be reconciled in Christ. It's astounding. Reconciliation requires that we experience change, that we give up our concern for winning arguments, for having others make our priorities their priorities. Reconciliation involves entering into a process where winning is not even the issue, where being right is not as important as being in right relationship. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? It's where being in relationship is about a new state of respect and care that lets go of whatever previous stumbling blocks there may have been. Of course, that's easier said than done. On small issues, we can be generous. We can let the other person win, knowing all the while that they've only won because we let them. But reconciliation, making real peace between us isn't about being right. It's about being connected, about being part of the oneness of God. And that is a completely different way of viewing what's important. Because in Jesus Christ, the one who is both human and divine, we are held together in one flesh. That sounds poetic and lovely. But when we try to apply it to the reality of the struggles we have, it can seem truly impossible. It's not always a comforting thought to find that we are bound together in the body of Christ with people with whom we have significant differences. We tend to find ourselves, I tend to find myself actually, more aware of the ways that we differ, the conflicts and the animosity, than in our commonalities. Sometimes it seems like the solution should be to emphasize our differences by discussing and arguing. But as Einstein is credited as having said, problems can't be solved with the mindset that created them. The reality is, however, that there are real differences between us. And sometimes people are not safe for us to associate. I'm all for appropriate boundaries when folks are abusive or toxic. But the bottom line is that we cannot ignore our own mental or physical health. So if that's the case, then reconciliation may not be possible. In those cases, the best we can manage may be to remember them as God's children and to remind ourselves that they, are, they too are beloved sons and daughters of God. But when that is not the case, as followers of Christ, we need to be part of the new creation, the divine dance that holds us together with those who were once our opponents. And this is a process that can be a particular challenge as we try to move from an attitude of antagonism to that of fellowship. God can do miraculous things to assist us in changing those attitudes, but it requires a certain amount of participation on our parts as well. So as we go forward in our prayers and in our daily life, let's remember those with whom we struggle in our differences as well as those that we easily love and care for. Let us continue to practice conversations and behaviors that are about seeking reconciliation, not winning the high moral ground. And let us remember that we are part of one flesh. Amen.